Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners And I want to thank Al so much for sending a one-time donation through support.greatdetectives.net. You can also send a donation via the Zelle app to box13 at greatdetectives.net, as well as mailing in a one-time donation to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 159 one three Boise, Idaho 83715. Or you can become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters at patreon.greatdetectives.net. Now it's time for today's episode of Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons. The original air date, November the 29th of 1945. And this one is the strange case of Charlie Lormer. I am the action. Only Hills offers double your money back if you don't get half hour relief. Hills Cold Tablets. Ladies and gentlemen, Colin O's Toothpaste presents Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction and one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday at the same time, the famous old investigator takes from his file and brings to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. Next time you buy a dentifrice, get high-polishing, high-foaming Colonos toothpaste or tooth powder. Colonos is a double-result dentifrice with a mouthwash effect built right in. Freshens your breath while you're brushing your teeth. Tomorrow, buy Colono. Now for Mr. Keene and the strange case of Charlie Lorimer. Our scene opens on a quiet country road which runs parallel to a wood. Two youngsters are on their way home after a brisk hike. And the late afternoon sun is slowly setting in the west. Boy, I'm getting tired of walking, Tom. Me too, Buzzy. So let's take the shortcut through the woods. Okay. My old man says this strip of woods is a nice piece of property. Says the guy who owns it ought to clear all this brush away and build a house on it. Well, I wouldn't want to live here. Why not? You don't know what they say. You mean all that baloney about guys disappearing in here? Oh, that's a lot of hooey. Well, all I gotta say is I wouldn't come here at night for a million bucks. Well, I ain't scared. Anytime you give me a dare to come through here at midnight... Was it? What's the matter? Look, there's a man over there asleep in the brush. Yeah. You better not go near him. He might be some crazy tramp. He ain't no tramp. Look at the way he's dressed. Then what are you going to do? Maybe he's sick, Tom. Maybe... Tommy. What? He's dead. <laughs> He's up there, officer. Right under the tree. Yeah, what tree? That big birch. Well, come on, let's have a look. Now, listen, you kid. I got more to do than fool around playing games. Fuzzy, he's gone. Sure he's gone. You ran into some tramp who was taking a snooze and you figured you'd make a detective story out of it. But, officer, he was lying right there. Yeah, and he looked like he was dead. Never mind. You got two minutes to get out of here before I haul you into jail. The both of you. Come on, Buzzy. Beat it now. <laughs> ah, crazy kid. Please sit down, Miss Larimer. Thank you, Mr. Keene. Uh, Mr. Keene, this is Mrs. Bender. How do you do? I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Keene. Emmy and my father were going to be married. Charlie disappeared the day before the wedding. You're a widow, Mrs. Bender? Yes, sir. Um, when did you last see Mr. Larimer? He came out to dinner to my house the night before last. I got a house near Trout River. That's about 50 miles from New York. I see. 
The night Charlie came out, he was feeling awful good. I cooked a wonderful dinner for him, the kind Charlie likes. I know when he likes my cooking because he always says the same thing to me. Jimmy, you're the best cook in this state. <laughs> oh, well, did you like the peas and yams, Charlie? I never tasted peas the way you cook them. Say, are uh, they delicious? Well, I preserved these myself this summer. I made up the idea myself of adding pepper and onions, you know, something tasty. Emmy, I'm a lucky man to get you for a wife. <laughs> you know the value of a dollar. Well, a man works hard for his money, and I feel I ain't got no right to spend it easy. Uh, if my first wife had felt that way, I might have been a rich man by now. <laughs> but I'm doing all right. <laughs> I know. Well, more preserved, Charlie. Oh, no, thanks. I eat so much I can hardly move. <laughs> I think I'll take a little walk. Maybe. Oh, walk now? Oh, why not? Just through the woods and back. Oh, it's so dark out there, Charlie. Oh, well, I'm not afraid of the dark. <laughs> well, you go ahead, but don't stay too long. Yeah, all right. Well, tomorrow's the big day, Emmy. You'll be Mrs. Charles Lorimer this time tomorrow night. <laughs> oh, I know. Hey, I'll be back inside half an hour. I'll see you later, Emmy. Well, just be careful, Charlie, please. And you never saw him again, Mrs. Bender? No, Mr. Quinn. Miss Lorimer, were the police notified about your father's disappearance? Not yet, Mr. King. We thought we'd wait to see you first. Well, I'll contact the state troopers in that vicinity. And then I'll get to work on the case myself. Mr. King, do you think that, that something's happened to father? I wouldn't become too alarmed without sufficient reason. If Mr. Lorimer had no enemies. Uh... Enemies? Do you know of anyone who might have wanted to do him harm? Why, well, I... Mrs. Bender, it's absolutely essential for me to get the facts. Please don't keep anything from me. I... I just thought of Seth. Seth? Who is Seth? A farmer. He lives two miles from me. He sold his farm a few weeks ago and moved away. Well, did he know Charles Lorimer? No, Mr. King, but he knew of him. What do you mean? Oh, I was supposed to marry Seth before I met Charles. And what happened, Mrs. Bender? I broke off with him on account of his drinking. Hmm. Was he jealous of Mr. Lorimer? Well, a few days after Seth sold his farm and moved away, he came back. It was late in the evening, and Seth was in a nasty mood. Who's that? Who is it? It's me, Emmy. Seth. Thought I'd come by and wish the bride luck. You get out of here, Seth, before I call the troopers. Where's the groom, Emmy? Nobody's here but me. Where's the groom? I'd like to lay a skull open with my stick. Seth, you're out of your mind. How does he like your cooking, Emmy? Does he like it just as much as me? Maybe you would have enjoyed a little more of my cooking if you hadn't. Never been... mind the lecture, Emmy. Save me to your husband. Well, maybe I'll meet up with the groom before the wedding. Hmm? He's got no time for the likes of you, Seth. You don't tell me. Well, I got time for him. Lots of time. Seth Kennery, if you don't hustle out of here fast, I'm calling the state trooper. I'm going, Emmy. I'm going. Remember me to the groom and give him my best wishes. Yep, my best wishes for an early burial. So long, Emmy. Happy wedding day. Mrs. Bender, why didn't you tell me this before? Because Seth ain't a bad man when he don't drink, Mr. Keene, and I figured his threats really didn't mean a thing. Do you know where Seth has moved to? No, sir. Well, did you ever see him again after that night? No, Mr. Keene, he never came back. Hmm. The case seems a little more complicated than it appeared at first. Could, could Seth have had anything to do with Father's disappearance, Mr. Keene? It sounds likely enough, Miss Lorimer, but let's not jump to conclusions. Give me a little time, a few days, to make a preliminary investigation. I'll try to get results. I only hope those results aren't tragic ones. You want to see me, mister? You're Officer Ryan? That's right. Well, I'm Mike Clancy. I work with Mr. King. And the two of us are making an investigation here in the neighborhood. For a missing man by the name of Lorimer. Mr. King sent me out here to... Make a routine report for the state police. I see. How long has the man been gone, Mr. Clancy? Three days. 
He was last known to be walking through that strip of woods near the river. Hmm. That's funny. What is, officer? Oh, two kids told me something about seeing a body lying under a tree just about that time. I went out into the woods with them, but there wasn't a trace of anybody at all. Well, do you think maybe they were playing a practical joke? No, I figured they might have seen some tramp asleep in the woods. Well, where can I get in touch with these kids, officer? I'll give you their addresses. They both live in Trout River. Oh, thanks a lot. Meanwhile, you can give me this man Lorimer's description and we can send out an alarm. We certainly appreciate your cooperation, Officer Ryan. We may be small towners out here, Mr. Clancy, but we've heard of Mr. Keene, the famous investigator, and we're glad to work with him any time. <laughs> Well, I got in touch with the kids' folks, Mr. Keene. Both boys will meet us at the edge of the woods right after school. Good, Mike. I guess you're planning on returning to that spot in the woods where they saw this fellow under a tree. I'm planning on going over those woods, Mike, if necessary, inch by inch. You're buzzy? Yes, sir. And I'm Tom, Mr. Keene. Are you boys familiar with these woods? We know them like the backs of our hands, Mr. Keene. Well, we've been playing and fishing around here ever since we could walk. Then there'd be no question about you uh, taking us back to the exact spot where you saw that man. We'll leave it to us, Mr. Keene. We can honor working with a famous detective like you. We'll take you there. That's the idea. Yeah, it isn't far from here. Just over that ridge. All right, boys. Let's go. Just over there, Mr. King. You got a gun, Mr. Clancy? Why? I'd feel a lot better if you had. Oh, Tom, he's always talking about ghosts. Don't pay no attention to him. Ghosts? They say funny things happen at night in these woods, Mr. King. Well, son, ghosts, banshees, and zombies are right in my line of work. Mr. King. Yes, Buzzy? Here's a spot. That's funny. It looks different. How do you mean, Tommy? Yeah, the ground wasn't all cut up this way. Well, there seems to be a reason for that, too. Looks to me, Mike, as if something's been buried under here, and recently. Want me to run back for a shovel, Mr. Keene? No, never mind, son. Sure, I can practically shovel this soil away with my hands. That's soft, boss. And let's get to work on it, Mike. And here's an old board, sir. You can use this. Thanks, son. <laughs> Easy, Mike. Whatever is there is buried very near the surface. I hit something already, Mr. Keene. What is it, Mike? Why do you look? It's a man. He's dead, Mr. Keene. Buzzy. Was this the body you saw under the tree? It... It doesn't look like the same one. It's the man we saw had on a, a different coat. He was... Mr. Keene! I know who he is. Who, Buzzy? He was still in a farm around here. Sure. That's Seth Kennery. In just a moment, we'll return to Mr. Keene and the astounding case of Charlie Lorimer. Now back to Mr. Keene and the strange case of Charlie Lorimer. A few hours ago, Mr. Keene and his partner, Mike Clancy, discovered Seth Kinnery's body buried in the woods. Now, in the small hotel room which Mr. Keene and Mike are occupying while they remain in Trout River... Well, this is the way I see it, Mr. Keene, too. The night Charlie Lorimer went out for his walk, Seth Kinnery was gunning for him. But Charlie beat Seth to the draw. Then what do you think happened, Mike? Well, Charlie got scared. He felt he might not be able to prove self-defense. So he buried Seth as fast as he could and then took it on the land. Well, that's a very good theory, Mike. If it went for certain other facts. What other facts? First of all, what about the original body under the tree? The one the boys first saw? Well, that may not have been a dead body at all, Mr. Keene. That fellow may have been just a, a sleeping tramp, just as the state trooper said. But, Mike, how do you account for the fact that Seth Kinnery had been dead for three days when we found him? Well, because that's when Charlie Lorimer killed him. Don't you remember, boss? It was exactly three days when... No. No. Wait a minute. Well... If he had been killed in the woods by Lorimer, the state trooper would have discovered it when he first hit the spot. That's right, Mike. Which means that the only way Lorimer could have killed him would have been to... To do it somewhere else. Hide the body for a day or two, 
Then bring Seth back to where we found him. That sounds like an awful lot of trouble, Mr. King. Well, frankly, I don't believe a man who kills in self-defense would be as cagey as all that might. No, the man who killed Seth was an experienced murderer who knew his business. Which brings us to where we were before, Mr. King. It seems to me, though, that Charles Lorimer holds the key to the mystery. Ah, if we could only find him. I'll take it, Mike. Hello? Mr. King? Yes. Come over to my house right away. Of course, Mrs. Bender. What's happened? I'll explain when you get here. Please come quickly. I'll be over there in 15 minutes, Mrs. Bender. Wait here for me, Mike. The state troopers are going to phone in regard to the autopsy on Seth Kinnery. I want to make sure we get that call. Right, sir. as quickly as I could, Mrs. Bender. Oh, Mr. King, I received this in the mail today. Just, just read it. Dear Emmy, I just want to tell you that you're free to do as you like. Don't wait for me to return. I can't and I never will. All my love, Charlie. He's alive, Mr. King, but I'm so worried. I, I heard about poor Seth Kinnery and... Well, now I feel that my Charlie may be in terrible trouble. Well, Mrs. Bender, we can't be certain this is from Mr. Lorimer. Well, why not? The entire letter is typewritten. It isn't even signed by hand. But Charlie's always used a typing machine. He has? Yes, sir. Let me see the envelope this came in, Mrs. Bender. Oh, the envelope? Yes. Well, I don't know what I did with it, Mr. King, but uh, that was typewritten, too. I want to see the postmark to find out where he was when he sent it. That is, if Mr. Lorimer did send it. Well, maybe I left it in the kitchen. I was so excited when I got the letter, I didn't know half what I was doing. Have you found the envelope, Mrs. Bender? No, Mr. King. I, I was almost certain, though, that I left it in here. Well, search the place thoroughly, please. Go through the cupboard. Oh, uh... It wouldn't be in the cupboard. That cupboard's broken anyway. I, I never use it. When did you get this letter, Mrs. Bender? Just a few minutes before I called you, Mr. King. I found it in my mailbox. And... Well, here it is, Mr. King. Here's the envelope on the sideboard. Hmm. There's, there's no postmark on it at all. Well, there isn't which means it was probably placed in your mailbox by the man who wrote it. Then Charlie's here and he's alive. I wonder. Oh, Mr. Keene, at least give me something to hope for. Oh, Mrs. Bender, it wouldn't be fair of me to tell you something I didn't believe. Then, then what do you really think, Mr. Keene? I think Charles Lorimer is dead. Oh, no. I'm sorry, Mrs. Bender. I wish everything didn't point in that direction, but it does. Charlie never hurt anybody in his life. He was such a good man. I may still be wrong. I hope so. In any case, in order to prove the facts, we've got to find the evidence. I'm going to take this letter with me, if you don't mind. But would you return it later, Mr. King? Of course. It's all I have left to remember, Charlie Bob. I'll take good care of it for you, Mrs. Bender. Are you all right? Yes. Yes, I'm all right, Mr. King. Then goodbye, Mrs. Bender. You'll hear from me again very soon. Mike. Yes, Mr. Keene. Have the police called. Not yet, boss. What was up at uh, Mrs. Bender's, sir? Mike, I've got an idea. Hello? Mr. Keene? Yes? This is Officer Ryan of the State Police. Oh, yes, officer. I'm calling from headquarters. They've just finished a post-mortem on Seth Kinnery's body. Mm -hmm. That bullet in his head wasn't the cause of death. Kinnery was already dead when he was shot. He'd been poisoned. What? Yes, sir, poisoned, but it was accidental. What do you mean by accidental? The man died of food poisoning. The doc said he ate something that was spoiled and it killed him. Food poisoning. That's right. We can't account for the bullet wound, though. Can you, Mr. Keene? Offhand, no. But I'll get in touch with you later if I have anything new of interest to you. Right, Mr. Keene. So long. Thanks for calling, officer. But Mr. Keene, you mean to say that fellow died because of something he ate? Well, that's the coroner's opinion, Mike. But what about the bullet in his head? Mike, I'm going back to New York to talk to Charlie's daughter, Nancy Lorimer, once again. You stay on the job here, and I'll return sometime tonight. Right, sir. This case has taken a decidedly different turn. Yes, I may have a job for you to do when I get back, Mike. A dangerous job. Do you have news, 
is it, Father, Mr. Keith? Not yet, Nancy. I came back to New York to ask you a few questions and to go through all your father's effects. You're welcome to search his room, Mr. Keith. Oh, thank you. First, I want to ask you one or two things, and please try to remember every single detail. It may mean the difference between solving this case or having it remain a mystery forever. Yes, sir. Now, this is what I want to know, Nancy. Any new developments, Mr. Keene? Yes, Mike. I think I found the answer to Seth Kinnery's death and Charles Lorimer's disappearance. You have, sir? I want to put an ad in the papers, Mike, the local papers. Have you got your pencil? Uh, yes, sir. I want the ad to run this way. Lonesome bachelor looking for companion. Between ages of 35 and 45. 35. Yes, Have you got that? Yes, sir. Now, well, here's the rest. Correspondent wishes to marry. Yes. Can offer $2,000 in cash. $2,000. In exchange for comfortable home. Is there a woman in the world who is lonely, too? Mm -hmm. uh, anything else, Mr. King? Well, that's all, Mike. <laughs> you're, you're not going into the marriage broker business by any chance, boss? Only temporarily, Mike. Well, who is the lonesome bachelor you're referring to, Mr. King? You. Me? me. That's right. Oh, no, I ain't so lonesome I want to hitch myself up to a woman I don't even know. I, I ain't even lonesome at all, Mr. King. You will be, the time being. You'll be a suitor, Mike, with $2,000 in cash in one pocket... And a gun in the other. Here's the letter, Mr. Keene. You're through in the base and it's worked. The rest is up to you, Mike. Let's get started. Mrs. Bender? That's right. Well, I, I'm the fellow who advertised in the papers. Oh, please, well, won't you come here? Well, my name is Clancy, ma'am. Mike Clancy. Well, Helen, I'm Annie Bender. I sure it's a nice place you've got here. <laughs> well, it's a lonesome place without a man around. Well, Emmy, I'm a man of few words. I got marriage in my mind. That's why I'm here. Yeah, well, you remind me so much of my first husband. He was straightforward like you. Well, we'll need some time to get acquainted, but just to prove here, I ain't a fellow who brags about what he can't prove. Look at this. My goodness. There's $2,000 cash in this roll, oh. and I brought it to show you that I was on the level, that I wouldn't take advantage of a nice widow like you by lying to her. Now, that's what I call straight talk, Mike. And now I've got to show you that I'll make a good wife. And the way to a man's heart, I found, is... Through his stomach. Well, now, if that's an invitation to stay to dinner, it, it's fine with me. <laughs> oh, I'll give you a real home-cooked meal. Everything's my own cupboard. I can my own vegetables, you know, and they're delicious. Oh, I'll bet. <laughs> oh, you'll be surprised, Mike. And please. Well, Emmy, I just can't wait. <laughs> Now, everything's ready, Mike. It certainly looks like a wonderful dinner. <laughs> well, why, why don't you get started? You must eat the peas before they get cold. And the roast. Well, I put lots of good fresh pepper and onions with the peas. My own special recipe. <laughs> Everybody raves about them. Well, go on. You take them. Yes. Say, what are you doing? Collect them. Collect them all. The evidence. Emmy... This food is poison. Huh? Just stay where you are, Mrs. Bender. Mr. King. Sorry I started you. I came up by way of the cellar. What is this, a frame-up? Is that your boots, Emmy? You killed Charles Lorimer by poisoning him, Mrs. Bender. What? With your special recipe of highly seasoned peas. He died as he walked through the lonely woods that night. The next morning, you brought his body here to your cellar, where Seth Kinnery was already buried. That's a lie. Later, you decided you could account for Charlie's disappearance by putting a bullet through Seth's head and leaving his body where it could be easily found. And if it hadn't been for oh, you... Oh, no, easy, Emmy. We don't want to get rough. You had met your prospective suitors by advertising in the newspapers for a companion, the way Mike advertised yesterday afternoon. You led them on, robbed them, 
Then got rid of them in your own quiet way with your delicious cooking. So you ought to have seen her eyes light up when she saw that roll of bills, Mr. King. <laughs> Thought I was an easy touch, eh, Emmy? That letter you wrote to yourself wasn't a very clever idea. Even though you thought so at the time, Emmy. And the newspaper ads I found in the late Charlie Lorimer's coat, together with his daughter's story of how you met him, was enough evidence for me. And an extra special pee sure worked fine in that dinner you fixed up for me, Emmy. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's the kind of a dinner you dished out to your poor departed husband. Well, what if I did? He was no better than any of the others. Mrs. Bender. Why shouldn't I get something out of him? Why shouldn't I get one with a million dollars like them games on Park Avenue do? Why not? Why not? I used any way I could think of to poison him. My husband? Yes, but darling. I'm clever, I am. I'm smart. They were crazy about my special recipe for peas. Mike, I suggest we escort Mrs. Bender into town. She has a date with another man. Have I, Mr. Peas? Yes. The chief of police. And so Mr. Keene solves the strange case of Charlie Lorimer, or as he sometimes called it, the case of Emmy and her delicious dish of tea. Would you like to smile this very minute and have your teeth reveal their natural brightness? And at the same time, would you like to know how to help get away from the suspicion that unwelcome breath, when caused by improper cleansing, may be holding you back socially and in business? Well, brush your teeth with Colonel's toothpaste morning and night, as you would with any other toothpaste, with this one exception. When you finish brushing with Colonel's, swish its rich active foam thoroughly to your mouth. For Kalanos is one toothpaste with a mouthwash effect built right in. Thus, it fosters a double result. First, Kalanos helps your brush remove ugly surface stains from your teeth and does it with utmost speed. At the same time, it freshens your breath while you're brushing your teeth. Try it and see for yourself why Kalanos toothpaste has been approved by dentists everywhere. If you'd rather have powder, then ask for Kalanos tooth powder. It offers the same high-polishing, high-foaming qualities and has a wonderful wintergreen flavor. Get K-O-L-Y-N-O-S. Toothpaste or tooth powder. Tomorrow, by Colonel. You've been listening to Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. On the air every Thursday at this time. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday when the kindly old place returns to the ballet murder case. Here's the fast, easy way to have beautifully shining floors. Just use no rubbing arrow wax. While you watch, it polishes itself to a marvelous luster that eliminates frequent scrubbing. Arrowax dries in minutes, but lasts for weeks. Get a full pint, costs only 25 cents. Get Arrowax, A-E-R-O-W-A-X, tomorrow. <laughs> Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, will be on the air next Thursday at the same time. This is Larry Elliott saying goodbye for Mr. Keene and the Whitehall Pharmacal Company, makers of Colonel's toothpaste and tooth powder, and many other dependable high-quality drug products. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surfer series. Oh, and a man's wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. Uh to be honest, I found this unrealistic, but mainly just because it's really hard for me to imagine uh, people getting sincerely excited over peas. Maybe if you're more into peas, you could buy into that more. I thought this was a decent mystery. 
with maybe a little touch of melodrama at the end. Well, maybe a big touch of melodrama. There weren't a whole lot of suspects, but we also didn't quite know what had happened to Charlie throughout the episode, which was the real mystery. And of course, our killer did make a really dumb mistake with the letter. Still, I enjoyed it, and I should say that this is actually the last episode we have for 1945. So, only two for 1945, and uh, we will have our one and only 1946 episode next week. All right, well, if you do have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and uh, become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Join us back here tomorrow for the Airmail Mystery, and then uh, next Monday, it's another episode of Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.